there we are. I'm still cold, so I'm wearing a long sleeve shirt. <laughs> but you just watch, and you know, as winter progresses, we get in through the fall and into winter. It won't bother me, and I'll be running around in shirt sleeves outside all the time because I'll be used to it. I'm not used to it yet. And the older I get, the longer it takes to get used to it. I like sitting in the chair with a blanket over my lap <laughs> and a cup of coffee or a glass of milk or something watching the football game. Football! But last night uh, was not a good game. It was a lot of mistakes, a lot for the Lions to be proud of, and a lot to tell the Raiders they still need to go back to the drawing board. <clears throat> anyway, those are my pronouncements like I know it all. But, you know, when you love football, you have opinions, just like baseball. Uh, and Jeremiah... The book of the prophet Jeremiah. We're in chapter 8. God is explaining their situation to them once again and explaining why it's happening to them and explaining why the judgment has come. At some points in here, he's talking about talking to Jeremiah. And uh, sometimes he's talking through Jeremiah. And sometimes Jeremiah is talking to God. So you just need to kind of look at the context. God said, "We just repeat, we'll go back yesterday and just pick that up. In verse 10 of chapter 8, Therefore will I give their wives unto others and their fields to them that shall inherit them. For every one from the least even unto the greatest is given unto covetousness from the prophet even unto the priest. Everyone dealeth falsely. Boy, it sounds like now, doesn't it? For they have healed the hurt of the daughter of my people slightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. And uh, the point of this is that they comforted them with false, pro with false comfort. It was all fake. They were just telling them a lie. It's a continuation of the lie about the temple, you know, the temple, the temple. And then people believe that God would not destroy Jerusalem. Cold weather is making my glasses fit weird, weirder than usual. Maybe when I went outside to take out the trash, they like, froze up or something. I don't know. But uh, they didn't believe that God would destroy Jerusalem because the temple is there where his name is and where his glory is between the wings of the cherubim, the outstretched wings of both the mercy seat on the Ark of the Covenant, which is a, a, uh, uh, a model, a, uh, a, a pattern of the throne of God in heaven. And this is a continuation of that peace, peace, but there's no peace. And God is going to explain to them their sin, and he's going to explain to them that the reason that they think all these bad things are coming upon them uh, are because of their turning away from him and worshiping false gods and committing national sin. Uh, and, of course, national sin is just a, a thing where personal sin has become so rampant that it dictates the, the direction of the entire country, just like we are now. Uh, the way the media is and the entertainment business and politics, if you don't say what the crazy people expect you to say, well, they just count you out. You're just done. And they won't listen to you. But uh, God starts explaining some more about their sin and about their judgment. In verse 12 of chapter 8, God speaks through Jeremiah, and he says, were they ashamed when they had committed these adulter these abominations? And God is talking to Jeremiah so that Jeremiah can tell the people these same things. Were they ashamed when they had committed abominations? Then God answers himself, Nay, 
they were not ashamed at all. They were not at all ashamed. Life is messy. But somewhere along the way, as a society, we got the idea that nothing is anybody's fault. That everything is some kind of physical sickness or mental illness or something in your background when you were being raised either by nature or by nurture, something went wrong. And it has gotten us to the point where nobody is ashamed of anything. Now, I'm not encouraging you to run around being ashamed. You know, we have... Uh, we have the word of the Lord that says that, uh, that, uh, that, that when we sin, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us of all unrighteousness. And when we've been cleansed of all unrighteousness, we don't have anything to feel guilty about. But society says that the guilt itself is bad. We shouldn't feel guilty that, that uh, there's no such thing as good and evil. There's no such thing as right and wrong. There's no such thing as truth and lie. As in beauty is in the eye of the beholder, there is no objective standard because they have thrown out the Bible. They have thrown out God's word. And what happens is, when we try to cure the ills of society using man's means and on our own and leave God completely out of it, which we've been doing almost my entire life, we destroy charity. We destroy judgment. We destroy faith. Because all we do is make society a better place to go to hell from because we've left God out of the picture. And then nothing is anybody's fault. That's why I left AA. I, uh, I used it as a crutch when I first got sober. And I've been in and out of AA for a long time trying to get sober or pretending that I was trying to get sober but at 5 a.m. February 6 1997 Jesus Christ delivered me from booze and I put the cork in the jug and I never had another drink I had a I had an encounter with him and he said that I had shamed him enough and if I didn't straighten up that he was going to take me home that happened 26 years ago, nearly 27. So I was delivered. But I would go to, to AA meetings. I was living in Nashville at the time and working in studios. And I, if I wasn't working, I was either asleep or I was at uh, church or I was at the AA meeting because I knew you couldn't drink there. And in a big city like Nashville, and, and you know, if you live in a big city like Houston or St. Louis or someplace like that, you can get a meeting just about any time of the day, including the meeting middle of the night. I stayed in AA meetings because I couldn't drink there. And when I got dried out enough, I quit going because it didn't feel real to me. And I'll tell you why. It doesn't feel real to me now. A few years ago, I went back to AA because my son asked me, he said if he was, he was drinking. And I, he said, if, if, if he went to AA, would I go with him? I said, sure, if that's what it takes to get you sober, I don't mind going along. And I did. 
And I got kind of active for a while because that's the way I am. If I'm going to be somewhere, I want to, I want to do some good. You know, I'm a natural, I'm an, I'm one of the guys that pitches in and tries to do stuff. That's just how I am. Well, after a while, I just had to leave because I realized I was lying. Because I had to get up every day and say in front of people, Hi, I'm Jimmy, and I'm an alcoholic. No, I'm not an alcoholic. I was a drunk. Being a drunkard is a sin. I was lost in the depth of sin and rebelling against the Christ who saved me and the God who made me. And I refused to accept responsibility for my own actions. I wasn't a drunk because I was sick. I was a drunk because I was a drunk. Jesus delivered me from that. So I'm not an alcoholic. I don't need any more treatment. I was a drunk, and now I'm not. And that is the plain fact of the matter. And I had to live through it and then get years between me to understand what it means the reason it says, were they ashamed when they had committed these, these abominations? Nay, they were not at all ashamed. As long as you can blame your sin on somebody else or on a disease or on an addiction or on society or on your parents or on your school or on the government, as long as you can blame your sin on somebody else, you will not turn to Christ for deliverance. And he is the only hope you have. He is the only deliverance you have. He is the only salvation you have. There are not many ways to God. There is one way, one way only. Enter ye in at the straight gate. For straight is the way, straight is the gate, and narrow is the way that leadeth unto life. And few, few, few there be that find it. So quit blaming your drunkenness on somebody else. Quit blaming your drugs on somebody else. Quit blaming your fornications on the ex-wife who treat, cheated on you. Quit, quit doing it. Stop. Stop now. Turn to Christ. Ask him to deliver you, and he will. How do I know? Because I've seen him do it to other people. How do I know? because the Bible says he will. How do I know? Because he did it to me. That old song is no secret what God can do. Was that to... can't remember. There is no secret what God can do. What he's done for others, he can do for you. Oh. Jesus can and will deliver you if you ask him to but you got to be ashamed and you know what keeps you from being ashamed is because you blame it on somebody else if it's not your fault then why should you be ashamed you know it's not enough to get a whore off the street now you got to buy her a three you know buy her a three bedroom house and give her a credit card i mean you know there's no there's no sense to any of it But if those people will come to Christ, things will change. Am I saying everything's going to get great? Now, it took years for it to get great in my life. I'm not so sure it's that great now. There are days I wish I was still drunk. But that's just sin, and I realize it for what it is. Because when you're drunk, you don't have to think about nothing. It also is a great time killer because there's a lot of things you can't do all the time. You can't eat all the time. You can't work all the time. Uh, you know, you can't watch movies all the time. You can't play games all the time. But you can drink all the time. You can drink the whole time you're awake. It's the only thing that I can think of that you can do all the time. Quit blaming somebody else. If you quit blaming people for your sin, you will start to be ashamed of your sin and you will turn to Christ. That's why it's always important 
to blame all of your troubles on yourself because that's who's responsible. Not your mama, not your daddy, not your wife, not your husband, not your kids, not your job, your wife, none of that. It's all your fault. As Pogo told General Trust Baldy, sir, we has met the enemy and he am us. We're, we're the enemy. Our sin is the enemy. And there's nobody without sin. For there is none righteous, no, not one. For all is sin and come short of the glory of God. Verse 12, were they ashamed when they had committed abomination? Nay, they were not at all ashamed. Neither could they blush. Remember, we're going back to the whore's forehead, the adamant, the flint. I've done nothing wrong. See, if you can say, well, I, I, I'm an alcoholic, you know, uh, my daddy had a, was an alcoholic and it gives me a predisposition to be an alcoholic and I have a, I have a sickness of the mind. Uh, I have an obsession of the mind and a sickness of the body. Yeah, I know the whole program. I know the whole terms, except it's not true. Sin is the only problem. You drink because you're a drunkard. When D Jesus delivers you from that and you don't drink anymore, you are not a drunkard anymore. The same thing applies to dope. Same thing applies to gambling. Same thing applies to sex and fornication and homosexuality and gender confusion and every other sexual perversion in the books. And you can also stop believing that it's okay to kill babies by human sacrifice that we call abortion. And instead of doing it in concentration camps, we do it in abortuaries and through the mail. But the, the second most thing that makes God mad is when you kill your own children. Look, this is the world. The flesh is weak. Our children are going to die soon enough on their own. We don't have to kill them. That is the reality. And those things are in God's hands. When you quit blaming somebody else for your trouble and blame yourself and your own sin and feel ashamed for it, then you can be delivered from it. It is called repentance. It is saying, God, you're right and I'm wrong. Fix me. They were not at all ashamed, neither could they blush. Therefore, they shall fall among them that fall. You can't be ashamed of your sin unless you admit your sin. You can't admit your sin until you understand that you have broken God's law and that it was wrong that you did it. No, it's just like when you get stopped by a traffic cop to trivialize the matter completely. And he's got his radar. I, he said, do you have any idea how fast you were driving? This happened to me back in June. <laughs> uh, do you have any idea how fast you were driving? And I said, I, you know, I, I, started to, I started to swear I was a smart aleck. I, I gave him a wise guy answer. He said, do, do you have any idea how fast you were driving. I said, no, but I'm sure you do. <laughs> is, is that begging for a ticket or not? <laughs> I hadn't gotten a ticket in years. I can't, you know, it was a long time ago since I got a ticket. And he said, well, you were, I was 25 miles on. It was by a nursing home where I have played and preached at frequently. <laughs> uh, but he said, you know, I was driving 40 miles an hour. Well, what am I going to do? Say, well, no, I wasn't. I, can't, I, I, wasn't I, I don't believe I was driving. Well, it doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. You broke the law. You were driving for, I was driving 40 miles an hour. So he says, you know, here's the ticket and his summons is on there. And you call that number and you either settle with the court or you can show up in court on that date or you can pay it ahead of time, whatever you want to do. I was all oh, cool. Well, I, you know. It never entered my mind to go to court because I had broken the law. I was guilty. I had done it. So, Candace, hello. <laughs> what a deal. Good to see you. Uh, I had broken the law, so I knew that I was guilty. Well, because of conscience, 
we know when we're guilty. We know when we've done wrong. It's, that's another thing that blaming our our faults and sins and conditions on somebody else. It has obliterated. Uh, it has obliterated our ability uh, to understand that uh, that the problem is ours. It's not society's again. Uh, we admit our sin and go to Jesus to cleanse us of that sin. And it says uh, in verse 12, Nay, they were not ashamed, and neither could they blush. Therefore shall they fall among them that fall. Anyway, when the invasion comes, when the Babylonians come in, and when the army comes in to, to destroy Jerusalem, these people who are not ashamed are going to die. They will fall. In the time of their visitation, they shall be cast down, saith the Lord. This is how he terms his judgment. When he visits these people, he's going to judge them. And he, he continues on in verse 13. I will surely consume them, saith the Lord. There should be no grapes on the vines, nor figs on the fig tree, and the leaves shall fade, and the things that I have given them shall pass away from them. To show them that they're in judgment, I am going to ruin their crops. I'm going to destroy their fields. I'm going to wither up their vineyards. And they're going to know that this thing is coming upon them, this visitation, this judgment. We've been talking about this for a long time. And uh, he is judging them for their sin. Their, their greatest sin was... Uh, was spiritual adultery, idolatry, idol worship, turning from God and worshiping other gods. They went, as the scripture says, they went a whoring after other gods. Their second greatest sin was the sacrifice of their children. Their third greatest sin, they passed them through the fire. They burned them as human sacrifices to the god Molech and their star rim fan and Baal. They thought that when their crops started dying and their, their prosperity started melting away and uh, the northern kingdom of Israel got taken away by the Assyrians and then the Babylonians conquered the Assyrians and now the Babylonians are fighting Egypt and they will destroy Israel and uh, Judah and Jerusalem in that process. Their good kings are all gone. They're left with nothing but bad kings, wicked kings. And so they start to see everything dry up. Does that sound familiar? You know, when I was 18 years old, making $2 an hour. On $2 an hour, I could make a car payment and rent an apartment. What do you think about that? Could you do that now? You know? You can't even you can't even hardly do that on one income at twenty dollars an hour. Now, now things have have faded away. The bloom is off the rose, as it were. The frost is on the pumpkin. Everything dies. Everything has cycles. Our society. It's corrupt. It's gangrenous. It's beyond salvation physically as a society. All empires fall. You know, we don't get a pass. But any individual in that falling empire, in that dying culture, in that doomed society, and that means you, you can be delivered both from your sin and from the judgment that's going to come upon us because you can be protected by the living God. I'm not saying you won't suffer. Yes, you'll have to suffer. We'll all have to suffer because when, uh, you know, when the price of gas goes up, we're all paying the same price. Price of meat goes up, price of bread, price of milk, we're all paying the same price. The righteous and the just alike pay when judgment falls. So we'll live through it. But at least we can live through it with hope.
need to turn to Christ now and realize that our decaying, disintegrating society around us, this corrupt, ugly, godless, graceless world that we're living in, that it is falling apart, but you don't have to fall apart with it. You can be delivered by Jesus. And that ultimate deliverance is coming soon. We call it the rapture. I've been preaching about it for days. He's going to come. He's going to toot. And we're going to scoot. Woo! We're going to be out of here. We'll be dancing the toot scoot boogie. We'll be in heaven. But only if you commit your life to him now. Otherwise, you'll have to live through. You think it's bad now. You really have to live it to it when the, when the poop hits the propeller, as they say. Verse 13, I will surely consume them. Who? Those who don't belong to him. There shall be no grapes on the vine, nor figs on the fig tree. The leaves shall fade, and the things that I have given them shall pass away from them. We will see. It could be fast, it could be slow, but we will see a steady decline in our wealth, in our statue, in our power, in everything we have. That is the destruction, the decay of empires. Most empires throughout history have not been defeated. They fell apart by their own rot. The Persian Empire was defeated. The Greek Empire fell apart by its own rot. The Roman Empire fell apart by its own rot. The British Empire, if you'll pardon me, mostly fell apart because it had to fight Hitler and for a while had to fight Hitler alone. And uh, so it more or less bankrupted them and their colonies. And that's why the British Empire fell from its former prominence. But most usually throughout history, these great kingdoms and empires have fallen through eternal rot. And the eternal rot, internal rot, is it also eternal rot unless you fix it and come to Christ. It is the rot, and you get to see it all go away. And then uh, he gets a little bit, a little bit uh, sarcastic with them. God does. In verse 14, he says, uh, he's mocking them, saying, why do we sit still? And why are we, what are we doing sitting here? Assemble yourselves and let us enter the defense cities and let us be silent there. And some people who are saying, our country is falling apart and the enemy is getting closer every day. And the crops are failing and the herds and the flocks are dying. We need to go into the defense cities where the fortresses are, where the soldiers are. And it says, let us be silent there. For the Lord our God hath put us to silence and given us the water of gall to drain because we have sinned against the Lord. Now he's going to go into an idea here. And I'm going to develop it tomorrow. See, the people have this idea. This entire message, going back to the first of chapter 7, is that where it started? Yes. We're in chapter 8, verse 14. He opens up, he'd been preaching through Jeremiah against this false religion of the people that they come and worship and form and function and ritual, and but they don't really believe and they don't love God and they don't trust God and their, their, their heart is not set on God. But they think if they go through the motions that God will deliver them. Again, it goes back to because they don't believe he'll destroy the temple. If they if they keep continuing in their temple worship and their ritual, then everything will be okay. And then they'll have peace, peace, in verse 11, peace, peace, when there is no peace. And God is saying, 
that there may be some thinking this. There may be a few handful of people doing this, but we'll see that that uh, that nobody is following through because he says, well, why do we? He said there will be some people who are going to say, well, look, why, why, why do we sit still? In other words, why do we keep taking this? Well, let's do something about it. Assemble yourselves. In other words, call the congregation in and we'll enter into the defense cities and let us be silent there. In other words, let us sit in sackcloth and ashes because he's given us gall to drink because we sinned against the Lord. And what is going to happen is that the people, just like the deception that God won't destroy the temple, just like the deception that there is peace when there is no peace, these people are going to think, if I act religious for a few days, then maybe God will repent and not do these things to me. It is the equivalent of somebody being in a jam. I don't know, maybe their maybe their kid's sick and you say, Lord, you know, if you just get us through this and uh and uh save my kid, I'll come to church every Sunday for the rest of my life. And then maybe you go a couple of Sundays, but then the kid gets all right and you never go back again. As a pastor, I see that all the time. You see, God cannot be tricked. He knows what's in our hearts. So even if you repented in sackcloth and ashes and sat silent before the Lord, and you've assembled yourself into a group in a fenced city, and you've gone there because the country all around you is falling to the enemy. That's no guarantee that he's going to do you any good. Because you're thinking, well, if I just act religious, if I just do the things that religious people do, then everything will be okay. But the fallacy of this is obvious on the service on the surface, it says, if I just act, if I just do. In other words, if I act like I'm religious, God will think I'm religious. Well, he already knows whether you're religious or not. And the point is never, are you religious or not? It's where you act, where you do. You see, religion says you got to do stuff. God started out this sermon by saying, I never demanded a sacrifice for you. I never demanded a sacrifice. I never demanded a burnt offering. I never demanded a drink offering. I never wanted anything from you except for you to obey my voice. They had a choice there at Mount Sinai, and they made the wrong one. And now, as they say, the chickens have come home to roost. Poll for do-overs. How many would you do over? We have sinned against the Lord. That is a great confession. But are you saying it because you think he wants you to say it? Or are you saying it because you're heartbroken, because you have sinned against the Lord? You see, that's the difference. He knows the heart. How many of you have had a teenager or a grown child, that will, a grown son or daughter, that will just, when they're around you, they'll say whatever they think you want to hear so that, so that you'll think they're doing okay? That, that, I mean, I, that happens to me all the time. I'm sure it happens to other people too. You know, they'll, 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 they'll say things in a way that hide the truth, but they're telling you what you think they think you want to hear. They're doing what they think they need to do so that you won't climb on their back. Well, this is what these geniuses in Judah are deciding to do here. I said, well, if we, if we just repent a few days, if we just fast a few days, and everything will be okay. No. 
is not about what you do. It's never been a what, what you do. It's about where is your heart. Is your heart toward God or is it away from God? Remember, you either belong to Jesus or you don't. Make sure you know which one today.